You do need to know the ruling family of Russia, as you have to know the other ruling families. So Romanov. They will rule Russia in an uninterrupted line for over 300 years, ended only by the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II and his son. You okay, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Right. I forget these, so I was like making sure I knew it. It should be a set of flashcards for you. <laughs> We're going to start before the Romanovs. Ivan IV is the first Tsar of Russia. It is okay for you to write Tsar as T S A R or as C Z A R. Either spelling is acceptable. You're translating from a not Western alphabet. Um, he is the first one to be a czar. All of the other Russian rulers before him were called Grand Princes. Um, he is the Grand Prince of Moscow prior to becoming the czar, but he has himself crowned, and when he does, he has himself crowned czar of all Russians. Um, he is significant because of his mental instability. Um, Ivan the Fourth was an excellent ruler and czar. He expanded Russia. He brought stability to the nation. He um, controlled the boyars. Um, the boyars are, of course, the Russian nobility. That should be in your notes from the reading, correct? Okay. Um, sometimes he controlled the boyars rather harshly, but that's okay because he was a, a czar and a Divine right, absolute monarch. Picking up on the theme in this chapter, finally, since we're at the end. Okay. Um, Ivan was married many times, but his first wife and his favorite was Anastasia. And no, that's not the Anastasia that they made the Disney movie about. She's in the 1900s. We're back in the 1500s here. Um, Anastasia gave him numerous children, but two survive into adulthood, um, Ivan and Fyodor. Um, Anastasia, unfortunately, comes to a sad end. And that end in and of itself wouldn't be so bad, except that Ivan actually lost his father when he was three. It's believed, um, well, we know, actually, sorry. We know that his father got a boil on his leg. You guys know what a boil is? It's like a big infected pimple, sort of. And the boil got infected, and they couldn't deal with it, and it led to blood poisoning, which killed his father. So Ivan became the Grand Prince of Moscow uh, when he was three. So his mother then served as his regent. When Ivan was eight, she died. And her death, was by poisoning, but not blood poisoning. Poisoning, poisoning. It was a very popular way to assassinate back then. And uh, it's believed that she was assassinated. Um, Ivan, of course, having lost his father at such a young age, was very attached to his mother, and it was pretty traumatic for him when she was killed when he was eight. Fast forward, now his wife dies, and it is believed she has been poisoned. Somewhere in Ivan's mind, this death of Anastasia uh, by poisoning, similar in the, to the way that his, his uh, mother died, Ivan kind of cracks. He loses it a bit. He becomes definitely unstable. Um, he had had a temper, always. Look like you'd want to cross that guy? Um, Anybody feel like if you moved, his eyes would follow you? Yeah, if you pull this up on the blog at home, try walking around your computer. I definitely feel like Ivan's creeping on me in this picture. It's... It's the fact that he's looking out of your corner. Out of the corner of his eye, yeah. And, and the dark circles, and yeah. He definitely looks like a guy who could just kill you with his mind. 
<laughs> so um, he gets violent at times. Ivan does some fantastic things. As I said, he really expanded Russia. He gave us one of Russia's lasting landmarks. He built St. Basil's Cathedral. You guys recognize this? From Red Square in Moscow. Um, many people look at this and say, oh, it's the Kremlin. That's not actually the Kremlin. St. Basil's is within the Kremlin. The Kremlin is a huge complex of buildings surrounded by a high red brick wall. Um, he built this to commemorate um, capturing some territory. So, you know, pretty awesome thing that he does here. After the death of his wife, though, I said he got unstable, increasingly unstable. Um, it was believed at one point that one of his sons may have been involved in a plot to kill him, but that wasn't really uh, conclusive, so nothing was done. Ivan, the, the eldest son, is married. His wife is pregnant. She runs into Ivan in the hall, palace, and uh, he's a little upset. Now, wherever Ivan went, he carried this big, tall staff, kind of like Gandalf, okay? Big, tall, heavy, oaken staff. And he slams it on the ground for emphasis and thumps things and gestures with it. He tells her that she is dressed um, improperly. Um, he thinks that for a married pregnant woman, uh, she does not look respectful. Um, it, essentially, he thought she was dressed like a whore and told her so and demanded that she go change. And she didn't immediately, you know, nod and go scurrying off, and so he struck her. She later suffers a miscarriage. Uh, he beat her for her insolence and whorish ways. So, how's her husband feel about that? So little Ivan comes storming in to talk to Dad and says, uh, Dad, you know, you, you can't do that. You convinced my wife. Um, you killed our baby. Um, you know, I'm going to be the czar. Have a little respect here. Don't be beating on my wife. That's my job to do. Oh. <laughs> um, well, truly, that's how you control your woman. Um, and Ivan not Ivan the fourth, not accustomed to being um, spoken to in this way, flies into a rage, strikes out with his staff, hits his son in the head and kills him. Immediately falls to his knees, holding the body of his dead son, uh, stayed there for several hours, uh, lamenting what he had done. It was a moment of rage and fury. He was not very happy. Um, it is his mistreatment of this son, the abuse of the daughter-in-law, um, and his other cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs kind of episodes that give him the name that you probably have heard him called by, Ivan the Terrible. So Ivan the Fourth and Ivan the Terrible are the same. Now this is before when we start studying Russia, but it's such a he's such an interesting character in Russian history that I wanted to just jump back there and touch on him for you. And there will be a quiz question over jolly old Ivan here. How many questions are on the quiz? Uh, there are 12 questions on the quiz. How many questions are on the quiz? 16. 16 points, 12 questions. Okay, so where does our study of Russian history actually begin? It begins with not the first Romanov Tsar, but the first significant Romanov Tsar. And the first Romanov czar um, is Mikhail Romanov, and on down through the line. But Peter the Great is our first uh, important guy. He is also Peter the First. Peter the Great or Peter the First. Okay. Peter um, becomes czar at the age of 10. And through kind of an awkward situation, he wasn't supposed to be the czar. His half-brother um, should have been the czar, but his half-brother was sickly. And um, 
I don't think there's a politically correct way to say this. Um, special. His, his half-brother was um, special and slow and would not have made a good leader. Are you, are you with me here? Yes. Okay. Um, so what they decided to do was make Peter and his half-brother Kozars because that's going to work out great, right? No. They're Kozars for over a decade. Um, Peter's actually doing the ruling on the Kozar side, it's all of the relatives kind of, you know, pulling the strings and puppeting, and it was just messy and ugly. Um, torture and arrests and plots are involved, and ultimately Peter gets to rule in his own right. So he becomes czar of all Russia's by himself. Peter, um, interesting, interesting fellow, loved to play soldier. Loved to play soldier. In fact, he loved to play soldier so much, he built a fort. Like, not a little toy fort out of popsicle sticks. He built a fort. You can do that when you're the Kozar in your pet club. Okay. Um, he loved to play soldier. And when Peter played soldier, he had uniform. And uniforms for his army. He got his own little army of other little boys. The nobility's sons were recruited to play soldier with him. That's awesome. And what fun is playing soldier unless you can do battle and go to war? Oh and so he would take his army and put half of it in one uniform and the other half in another uniform, and they would go in the fort with their cannons, actual cannons and guns, actual guns, and he would order the army to attack the fort. Yeah! Awesome stuff, huh? I mean, that'd be cool. And he wasn't him. doing it because he was sick or cruel or mean. He was just having fun. It yeah. was his right to do so. Because he is the czar, and these people are his servants, basically. And he was making himself a better military leader and general. What the? And zinc. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, zinc, zinc, zinc. Yeah, I'm sorry you were attacked by Frankencorn. <laughs> Where did he come from? He was attached to the wall. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was attached to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of. <laughs> 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 Both are guys that was, that was kind of creepy. Are you okay? Yeah. Wait, what did it fall back on earth? What? <laughs> Where was it? It was, it was like sitting on top of the ledge there next to the studentism's poster. How is that even possible? Like, it went backwards and way out here. I, what do you, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not a physics class. You have class. a haunted classroom. And it, like, no, the studio really is haunted. Um, but maybe, maybe Frank and Corn thought Casey was cute. The studio's haunted? Uh, who was Casey? Casey was haunted? Casey? 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 The studio's actually haunted. How is it haunted? Um, a there's a ghost. It's a, it's a friendly and benevolent ghost. Um, you'll walk in and computers that haven't been touched since we all left the day before will have different programs open on them. Or they should sure all be dark and have the screensavers going. No, you can be sitting there like on a Saturday afternoon working and there's maybe two of us in there and all of a sudden one of the other computers will wake up. Shouldn't happen. Um, <laughs> what did you do the first There was one time, and, and a former student actually has this on video on his cell phone. We're sitting there, it was a Sunday night, and we're editing. We've been up there all weekend. I assume we were infringing on the ghost's personal space too much but being up there all weekend. And we both kind of turn around and there's a computer over here against this wall and it's just going... The mouse is clicking and the screen is flickering every time the mouse clicks. And the mouse is physically clicking because with Apple mouses you can see it. But yeah. So we walked over there and it's actually going and it's tick 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 tick. That is that terrible. terrible. I will keep my hands. Have you ever been up in the booth in the auditorium? Yeah. Okay. That is it's haunted up there. there. And um, in the uh, green room. Because the bathroom lights and stuff, they'll flash on yeah, and off, turn on and, and off, off. Even when nobody all the time, them. and the makeup lights will go on and off, and no one's there, and those ones aren't sensors. In our refrigerator in the studio, we put stuff in there, and you come back, and it's rearranged. 
Would you do the first That's thing like someone like that? And creepy at the you same think, time. oh, somebody else was in here. You start, you know, Reason. and then it was a ghost. Yeah, and then when things happen while there's somebody else there, you know, you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, yes, did you, like, freak out when the thing with the mouse happened? We were, we were weirded out, but then it. we just kind of decided that. It's time to leave. Ghosts have personalities, and um, he was just saying, hey, drawing our attention to him. And Sam has ghosts. Do you? Allie's, Allie's house is haunted. Yeah. Allie's oh, house is haunted. Don't even talk about it. It is a baby that was drowned. Do you remember that tramp? And we used a Ouija board, and it like... You do not I don't, I do not believe the Ouija board. They all moved it. That was a lie. Well, yeah. Sydney picked up her finger, it stopped moving. And, and then, then when Allie messed up and one of her fingers slid off, the whole thing tipped and stopped moving completely. And it was because she was moving it. <laughs> and that was not Ouija real. Boards. That's so, not yeah. I'll have to edit that out of the uh, podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. You can put that as an extra. on the quiz. Yeah. 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 So, I found it. Yeah. What? I found it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think found it. <laughs> no, it found Karen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Karen, my love. <laughs> Jesus, like, you was like so I threw myself to my death. <laughs> section of the human body wants to know how things work and the doctor uh, teaches him how by pulling on ligaments and tendons you can make things happen and so he has some fun moving the arm and the leg and stuff and, oh, oh, so um, cool. so he has a dentist teach him how to pull a tooth um, he learns way. how to build a ship um, he's a pretty good carpenter um, he can sing and dance and write and I mean just everything he actually goes on a grand tour of Europe. Uh, he heads over into Western Europe. He's incognito. Wink, wink. Um, Peter is 6'8". Oh, seriously? He is 6'8". That's like a foot and a half taller than me. He is 6'8", in a time when the average person is maybe 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, okay, so he's real tall. And he is a tall, really skinny guy. So he's not tall and husky and stout. He's tall and really skinny. And his head is not right for his body size. It's, it's too small. Too small. He had really small hands and feet. Um, so it, it's said that when he walked, it, it was odd looking. Okay. Um, he is, of course, still bizarre, so an entourage goes with him, and he, he believes he's traveling incognito to Western Europe. Um, you can't go incognito when you're Peter the Tsar of all Russia uh, and you're six foot eight with 100 people traveling along with you. So there were people in his group who would go ahead of where he was going and pay people off to act like they didn't have a clue who he was. <laughs> Um, so he spent time in a shipyard learning how to uh, build ships. In fact, one of the first things he does when he returns to Russia is ordered uh, the first capital ship of the Russian Navy to be built and helps to lay down the keel, the, the main spine of the ship himself. He helps to hew the logs, etc. Um, he learns languages. He studies the economies of Russia, or of, of Europe. Um, and so when he returns to Russia, um, and is, he's called back unexpectedly early, 
uh, because there's a rebellion amongst the army. Um, when he comes back, he has some goals for Russia. And he has, he has three primary goals, Peter does, for Russia. He has three primary goals for Russia. Peter has three primary goals for Russia. He wants to modernize Russia. He wants to westernize Russia. And he wants to provide Russia with a warm water port. Now, those are his goals and not necessarily in that order. Um, in order to pay for the modernization and westernization of Russia, Peter's going to need money. And so, in order to get money, he will need to trade, which means that he needs a warm water port. So, he makes that the first thing he's going to get. And who does he engage to try and get that warm water port? He attacks the Ottoman Empire. Okay, picture your map of Russia. Where is he hoping to obtain this warm water port? On what body of water? The Black Sea. The Black sea. Now, if he gets a port on the Black Sea, how is that going to do him any good? He will have to exit the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. Who controls access from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean? The Ottoman Empire. So Peter is actually not just hoping to obtain land that borders the Black Sea so he can build a port. He kind of needs to conquer the Ottomans. Because if you just go down and whoop them and take some land, are they going to let you pass without huge fees? No. Okay. Well, it's a moot point because... Oh, Peter's army gets whooped. They get routed. Why? Nope, not rebellion. They're what? No, it has nothing to do with their clothes being dressed for a Russian winter. <laughs> it has to do with the fact that the Ottomans have been trading, and so their technology and training is modern, and Russia's is not. So, turns out, maybe Peter said about trying to get his goals in the wrong order, right? Maybe he needs to, to modernize before he tried to get the warm water port. But wait, how are you going to pay for the modernization? Well, he starts trade routes over land with Europe. Now, think about this map of Europe. The largest major capital anywhere near Moscow is in Poland. That's a long ways. Long ways. And you can't really travel across Russia in the spring because the snows are melting and the mud is about hip deep. So summer and fall, pretty much the only time you're going to be able to trade. You can sail in the spring, but not down the rivers because they're all flooding with the snow melt. So it's limited, but he's got to get some money. First thing he decides to do is modernize his military. So what he does is he goes, he sends emissaries to the west to hire, um, like, sergeants from the western armies to come over and train his soldiers in western tactics. He buys weapons, so he upgrades his weapons, he upgrades the tactics, and he hires these folks to basically run the military and teach his own men how to fight in modern war. Modern for early 1700s. Um, so once he's done that, now it's time to go to war again. Against whom? Now, Sweden! Charles the Twelfth of Sweden needs to go down. Is Peter successful this time? Does your book not tell you? What? He wasn't at first. But he turned around and went back for a second helping, and this time he is victorious. Russia acquires most of what is Finland today, the territory that is Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, 
the Baltic states. Prior to the war with Finland, or with Sweden, sorry, because Sweden, there was no Finland then, that was all Sweden, okay? Prior to that war, Russia did not go clear west to the Baltic Sea as it does today. So he acquires all of that land. Well, it's not exactly a warm water port, but now he at least has a port to the west. Well, kind of. He has, he has a river with a lot of swampy ground around it that drains into the Baltic Sea. And he says, ah, a warm water port. Well, not exactly warm, Pete, and port kind of requires a, a city and docks and stuff, you know? And he says, oh, no, you're just not seeing it. You got it. It's, it's right here. Peter the Great builds a city from scratch on the Baltic. He names it after himself, St. Petersburg. Okay, St. Peter's City. Um, how does he build this city? Well, it was swampy land. So he's going to bring in serfs and peasants. Basically, on the backs of Russians. They say St. Petersburg is built on the bones of Russians. They had to cart in earth to backfill the swampy land. They had to raise the level of the earth. Do they have bulldozers and backhoes? No. Do they have um, steel shovels and steam engines? No. Nope. Wooden shovels and buckets and your hands. And they would put the buckets on yokes, those boards that go across your shoulders. Have you seen? Yeah, yeah. so they okay. carry two. Or... Oh, really? So you can yeah. carry two at a time, and it's balanced, and it's not strained on your shoulder joints. And they would walk for miles to go and dig up the soil, fill their buckets, trudge back, dump it, go back, go back, go back, go back. Now, before they could even start building St. Petersburg, they had to build shelter for themselves. So they cut down the trees and build themselves little huts and cabins. Okay. Swamp water, good to drink? No. No. Uh, they weren't schooled in where they should put their sanitary facilities. Um, so they end up with contaminated water. They get dysentery. Uh, there is malaria. There's typhoid. Um, there is a lot of death from exhaustion, starvation, etc. When the winter comes, they can't do any work because the ground is frozen. There aren't supplies. Of course, they haven't been farming to provide foodstuffs for them, so food needs to come in. It doesn't come in in adequate numbers. That's okay. We've got plenty more Russians. We'll just bring in more people in the spring. Tremendous number of people died to construct St. Petersburg, but it is a good port for trade with the West. With St. Petersburg, Peter does not build a Russian city. He builds a Western city. The building and architecture style are very Western. The colors are Western. Uh, when you look at St. Petersburg, you can't um, immediately without um, looking into background and looking for hints and signs and stuff, you can't tell whether you're looking at um, an Austrian or a German city. Um, the colors and the architecture are very much the same. When it comes to westernizing, Peter wants to change Russian society, everything about it. Um, Russian nobility had always worn very long, uh, heavy robes and furs. Peter wants them to stop that and start dressing more western um, pants and shirts and coats and ties, hats. He demands that the Russian nobility shave their beards. They must be clean shaven. Um, that is a huge thing. He thought that um, wearing the beards was a very backwards um, kind of, we would say redneck sort of hick sort of thing. Yes? This is kind of random, but like, when did he shave back then? They had blades. Blades. They had blades? Yeah. 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 They had metal. They just mm -hmm. didn't have steel. Okay. I just, steel. Just, yeah. Have you seen how in like the 1950s when they do like this thing? The straight razor? Yeah. It'd be kind of like that. Um, no shaving cream, per se. Oh. Um, when Peter would meet 
a noble on the street who had not shaved his beard, go up to that man, grab him by the beard, pull his big old knife out, and cut the beard off. And the boyar would then be, of course, sent home to shave the rest of it. Um, women, prior to Peter's court, were pretty much left at home and forgotten about. Peter wants them brought out. He had enjoyed the discussion between men and women that he saw in the West. The women have to dress in Western styles, which is uh, more revealing by far than what Rus Russian women had been accustomed to. But he has them uh, don Western style dresses. The men are forced to bring them out and they start having dances and parties and dinners. And the women are like, wow, because this opens huge opportunities for them. Um, they also get some access to education. Peter creates the first newspaper in Russia. He wants his population to be educated and aware. So he asks them to modernize their clothing, to get a little education, to shave their beards, creates the newspaper, Yes, bless you. Our next major Russian ruler that we'll talk about is Catherine the Great. My nickname for her has always been Kate the Great. Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great, possibly one of the greatest Russian czars ever, was not even Russian. She was German. She was a German princess. She gets married off in a diplomatic arrangement to an heir to the throne of Russia who was a goofy. He was really goofy. It would have been Peter III. He actually does become the czar, um, but he liked to play with toys. He liked to dress up like a soldier, uh, but he liked to play with toys. He... Um, he did manage to uh, spend enough time with Catherine to produce some heirs, but then pretty much stopped spending any time at all with her. Um, he may or may not have um, liked to spend time with his manservant. Um, and he would lock her out, lock Catherine out of his apartments and have all kinds of tin soldiers. And he and several servants um, would spend days arranging them in battle formations and carrying out the attacks and stuff. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, he continued doing this even after um, his father had died and he succeeded to the throne. Um, so Catherine makes some arrangements. And uh, it's believed that one or two of her lovers and former lovers and a close family friend may have taken Peter hunting out to a hunting lodge where he had some sort of an accident and um, died. And Catherine became Tsarina of Russia. Um, it's not real clear. I mean, Peter had kind of a tummy ache when they left. He may or may not have been being poisoned for a long time. Um, the body was awfully bruised and beaten up when it was brought back to Russia. Um, yeah, kind of shady goings on, but that's the way it was done then, sort of. So Catherine becomes Empress of Russia. Um, she is also a divine right, absolute monarch. And we're going to talk about her again in chapter 5. And we're going to talk about her in kind of a different way. But we're talking about her in this section as a divine right absolute monarch. Times will change while she is on the throne, and she will change. 
Um, Catherine was no slouch when it came to ruling Russia. She expands the territory tremendously. She will war with the Ottomans. She will um, have diplomatic dealings with the Habsburgs. She and Prussia and Austria together multiple times will carve up Poland um, in a series of events called the Partitions of Poland. You guys know what a partition is? It's a division. Okay. They'll partition Poland repeatedly. Um, <coughs> Catherine even takes one of her former lovers and makes him the king of Poland. Um, for two reasons. One, she wanted a friendly ruler on the throne. And two, she wanted him out of her way because she was so over him and that was so yesterday. And he was still like, oh, Catherine, I love you. I love you forever. And she's like, yeah, yeah, go be king over here. Um, he took it um, not, not unaware of the fact that had he stuck around, he might not have survived perhaps very long because he was a reminder to Catherine of something she enjoyed at the time but was no longer proud of. And so to have him underfoot all the time was just like a constant reminder that, ha ha, you slept with me. So um, they had had actually a, a fairly sustained and passionate relationship and she had still had some affection but she didn't want it, her nose rubbed in it all the time and he um, kind of tried to take advantage and push and pressure for things, and so she's just like, yeah, the pull is with you. <laughs> she was his sugar daddy, sugar mama. <laughs> she was kind of a cougar, too. Um, to <laughs> Kind of to the end of her day, she took various younger lovers. So Catherine the Great, first cougar in history. <laughs> um, she does not have a great time dealing with the boyars in Russia. Um, there is a lot of change going on in Russia. She has continued westernizing and modernizing. By the way, um, about a 50 year difference between Peter and then Catherine, they don't follow each other right on. Um, they are different in one way. Peter, kind of like Louis in France, takes power from the nobility in order to make himself a stronger monarch, okay? So he weakens the nobility. Catherine, for her part, and as a result of the changing times, is actually forced by the nobility to give them some power back. Um, it's an interesting thing. Hello? Yes? Yes, Sam Laughlin. Sam Laughlin? Yes. You need him? Oh. Office. I'm, you're cutting out, but I'm going to send him down to the office? Yes, to the health office. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to come down. <laughs> He's going to take his pen medicine. They don't kick in that fast. Um, so a noble, if, okay, there's one monarch, right, and a whole lot of peasants, and a couple handfuls of nobility, right? So you would think that the monarch needs the peasants to like him or her in order to stay in power, right? But wrong. The monarch needs the support of the nobility because the nobility have the day-to-day -day contact with the peasants. They control them. They control the land. They control the productivity, right? So a monarch has to do what they have to do to keep the nobility happy in order to keep the support behind them. Because if the nobility can rile up the peasantry, then English Civil War time. Okay. Um, questions? Um, lecture tomorrow is actually video segments over Ivan, Peter, Catherine. I, it's, some of the stuff in Russia is just too amazing for you not to be able to see it. No questions?
Really? Okay. So I covered everything that was in that section to a depth that you're happy with and gave you Ivan and we still have time left? We can still ask questions. Yeah. 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 Have you not read and taken notes? No, I haven't. But I'm going What's to the German quarter? The what? The German quarter. The German quarter. I was reaching out about how much since we had about and then I took Is there anything What about Phytus Bering? Yeah. Um, Bering is the one who explores along the eastern coast of Russia. That's why we have the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait. Um, yeah, Peter pays for those explorations and stuff. You don't have to memorize him, though. Okay. He's important, but not, not to There's the level of test worthy. Uh, do we need to know the difference between the expansion Catherine did versus what Peter did? You need to know the difference between Catherine's expansion and Peter's expansion. Um, I'll answer that very specifically. You need to know Peter attacked the Ottomans and lost, attacked Sweden, and won, and why he lost and then won. For Catherine, you need to know she also attacked the Ottomans without success and then acquired Poland through partition.